Hi everyone, thanks for coming out. Um, first off, we're just going to introduce ourselves a little bit. When I met with Steve and Mike and Sean, they mentioned that mostly what, what folks are interested in hearing about is our background and how we kind of got here in hopes that maybe that can inspire some of you to, uh, to make some decisions about where you want to go after university. So I studied a Bachelor of Science in Earth and Environmental Science at the University of British Columbia, so not engineering. Um, my background was mainly in climate change policy and environmental impact assessment. I really got into solar, I worked a summer in 2012 here in Saskatoon working for a solar company and that's where I really got the experience in the field and from there I was just super excited about renewable energy, um, particularly solar. And so in my fourth year I did an honors um, thesis research project which was a year long project. The summer before that I was living in Nunavut on Baffin Island and there was a community there that was wondering how they could transition from diesel power generation in small communities to other alternatives. So I took it on as a project to look at whether or not, originally I hoped to do all renewables, but that's just not possible in a year. So I focused in on solar and whether or not it was feasible for solar to, if not take over from diesel, to, to sort of work with it and and reduce their reliance on diesel generation. So that's kind of how I got into solar. I graduated with my Bachelor of Science in 2014, worked for a couple months abroad, and then um, spoke with the folks at My Energy and started working there, I guess, a year ago now. So that's kind of how I got to where I am today. And Dave, tell you a little about myself. Yeah, I uh, did a degree at the University of Regina and um, started working in the industry right after, but my final year project was focused on uh, small wind energy. At the time, there really wasn't much of an industry at all in net metering or uh, solar. Uh, it started in small wind energy, and um, focusing my final year project, I got a, a grant, um, uh, an award for my final year project, and met some people that were starting a business at that time. They hired me to uh, start the community or the commercial side of their um, uh, business related, related to uh, renewable energy. Um, that's basically my story, and um, you know I've been with my energy for a couple of years now. Before that, was, I was with another company, and we were doing wind energy, uh, geothermal, and uh, solar energy. And over the last five or six years, in particular, solar energy has really taken off, and, um, a lot bigger than wind energy is anymore. So yeah, that's it's kind of my story. There, we're hoping to have lots of time for questions at the end, but um, if you have questions and you're comfortable just yelling them out, feel free to do that. But if you do have questions like in particular about us or how we got to where we are today, we're going to leave lots of time at the end for questions too. So I'm going to speak a little bit first um, about my energy and also just about solar technology in general. Um, so. My Energy is a company, we're based here in Saskatoon. We do work all over the province. We have over 1,200 geothermal and solar systems installed. Uh, we saved our customers over $20 million in operating costs and taken over 80,000 tons of CO2 that would have been emitted from other, or other sources out of the atmosphere. And that's, that's the equivalent of removing over 15,000 cars from the road. So that's just a little bit about our impact as a company. Um, what we do, so we do geothermal um, for heating and cooling, solar photovoltaic and energy management, so working with our customers about how they can reduce their energy use before they actually invest in, in a renewable option. Obviously using a, a whole ton of power when you're using renewables also isn't a good thing, so we work with them on how they can be more energy efficient in their home or their farm or whatever they're, whatever they're working with. So those are a few things that we offer as a company. So solar power, is there anybody in the room who's like super familiar with how it works and would want to give an explanation that's better than the one that I wrote here? Don't be shy. No one, okay. Because <laughs> this is my like really, really, I don't want to use the term that I'm going to use, but it's really simplified from obviously what if you took a course in solar photovoltaic, it would probably be a, a lot more detailed, but 
solar photovoltaic. It converts sunlight into electricity via the photoelectric effect and an electrochemical process where crystallized atoms are ionized, creating a direct current electricity. That's what one cell does. A cell is combined into a bunch of cells together in a solar panel, and those panels are combined together to make an array of whatever size you need to meet your needs. So that's a very, very simple version of how it works. Uh, this process occurs without any moving parts, so this is something that's really unique to solar as a renewable energy source because many of the other options, um, wind, hydro, tidal, all of those things have moving parts that are subject to things that have high forces, therefore the maintenance costs of those things go up quite a lot. So that's something that's really unique to solar, um, especially in cold cold, harsh climates like we live in in Saskatchewan and where I was working before um, in northern Canada. Solar is something that makes a lot of sense because it, it reduces those maintenance costs significantly. So that's something that's really positive. Um, the conversion occurs without emitting any environmentally harmful emissions. So this is talking about the actual process of converting it doesn't emit any emissions. Obviously, the production of solar panels does still have an impact. but. Basically, every solar company out there is continually striving to do it with less and less environmentally damaging chemicals or processes. Um, solar now has the third highest installed capacity globally, and that's just behind hydro and wind, and it's gaining really fast. So if you were to do a simple Google search in Google News about solar energy, that's all that you see is how quickly it's grown in all of these years, even though other industries have fallen. Yeah. So um, why is there a decline in the other ones? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if there's necessarily a decline in the other energy systems yeah. that are providing power. Yeah. I think uh, you know, in general, there's a lot of regulatory issues around climate change, things like that, that are starting to um, create opportunity for other things. But the biggest reason why solar is gaining is the cost of it, mm -hmm. as it ramps up production cost them down, makes it easier to do more projects. Yeah, and so I wouldn't say like solar is gaining and wind is necessarily like oh. dropping off. Sorry, I don't know, maybe I, I alluded to that, but yeah. it's more like wind, tidal, hydro, those things are kind of staying the same, while solar is is drastically increasing. And you see that especially in the, in the United States where um, the investment, so the financial side of it that's gone into solar or wind, even in the past year, um, has been exponentially higher than in past years. So, um, which has a lot to do with, like you said, operating costs, but also the cost to produce it is so much less. If you're gonna put up a wind turbine, yes, it's gonna produce a lot of energy, but the costs associated with installing that and then maintaining it are really high. So that's, is that kind of answer? Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, so this is a map that any of you can view. Um, it's you can look at these on Red Screen, which is a program offered by Natural Resources Canada. Um, you can do some really cool solar analysis on there. I used it a lot in my fourth year project. So I don't know if people can really see the colors here, but what's really, really cool in the province that we live in is we have the best solar resource available in Canada. So you'll see this little blurb right here that's a little bit darker orange. So southern Alberta, southern Man Manitoba, but almost entirely all of southern Saskatchewan um, has really high solar resource. So that's another thing that makes it really unique as a, as a technology here in Saskatchewan. This website, if you get a chance to check it out, is really cool because you can use like a particular um, waypoint or GPS point, so like your farm or your house, wherever you're from, and you can actually do like a little bit of analysis of like, you can look at different angles that you can put your panels and anyways it's kind of cool free resource that you can play around with a little bit that's how I learned to use it so yeah um, in Saskatchewan we have something called a net metering program so most of our customers that we install solar for are are grid tied so they're not using a giant battery bank to sustain their lifestyle they're connected to the grid so the way SAS power works is um, they have a net metering program, so they will not pay you a premium on the electricity that you produce. They basically pay you what you're paying, so it's 
they're not paying you at all. They're, you're building a credit on the grid for the, in their system. So the way to think about it, or the way I think it's easiest to think about it, is to think about the grid as, as storage. So in the summertime, you might be producing more electricity than you're actually using. You will store that on the grid, build a credit with SAS power, and then in the winter time when you're producing less, you'll pull from that credit from SAS power. So it eliminates the need for most folks to have batteries, um, which the cost of technology associated with batteries is still challenging and still the cost is really high. So that's the way it works in Saskatchewan. The net metering program is for systems under 100 kilowatts. So that's most um, farms, most systems are under 100 kilowatts. Um, there's tax incentives for businesses and farms, which is awesome. So they're able to use it as a, a write-off or something for farmers and different businesses. And then SAS Power themselves offer a 20% rebate on anything of, that you install for the total installed cost. So if you spend $50,000 installing a solar system, they're going to write you a check for $10,000 cash back. So that's really positive. That's available for sure until the end of November of 2016. Hopefully, given the statements that the province has made regarding renewable energy, that'll be continued, if not improved. Um, but for now, the only guarantee is till November 2016. So, but it's an awesome program, so hopefully they're able to, if not improve it, definitely continue it. Uh, these are just a few project photos of work that we have actually done. Uh, I don't think any on this page I was actually on, but that one on the far side <coughs> there is the Broadway Theatre install, which our company did, was it last winter that that was completed? Uh, Broadway two winters ago. Two winters ago, okay. Um, yeah, so that's a big install. You can't see it, obviously, from Broadway, but it's on top of the Broadway Theatre. This shows, this picture in the middle here shows there's solar on the roof as well as solar on the ground. Um, we do both. We do a lot on the ground as well. Um, this next one, I'm familiar with both of these systems. This one is installed in Regina, and this one is near Borden. That's an 18 kilowatt system, so that's quite a big system, the one on the ground there. So yeah, that's kind of how our, our systems look. I just wanted to show a few pictures. At the end, I'll give you um, the links to our social media. So I always post pictures of the systems and where we're installing and all that stuff on our Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. So you can follow along with, with where we are around the province through that. And um, part two, I'm going to leave for Dave. That's true. I don't know why that's doing that. I'll yeah, try to. That's okay. I'll just... Okay. So uh, this project here, this is a little bit bigger. This is um, just east of Saskatoon. It's a 30 kilowatt project. It's for uh, a new acreage development, uh, Tuscan Ridge Estates. It's um, uh, an example of some of the new um, ways that uh, people are integrating solar into business plans and that kind of thing. Um, part of the reason why the acreage development got approved was solar was a big part of uh, their plan. So the people in Corman Park saw that. It was different than other, uh, other proposals that they'd seen, and uh, it was part of the reason why um, it was approved. So, this system will provide uh, some power for all the acreage owners that uh, are going to be building there in the future. So I'm going to start with some of the challenges that we face on a daily basis and uh, move through into some of the opportunities, reasons why solar is growing really fast in Saskatchewan, and then uh, finish with some predictions for what we're going to see in the future. So some of the, the challenges, education and regulatory. Um, regulatory working with SAS power and working with the government, it's really one and the same a lot of the time. Uh, a lot of the policy gets pushed through the government into SAS power, and SAS power kind of uh, offers um, rebates right now, like Jen was alluding to through the net metering program. Um, that rebate has come and gone in the past, so some of the challenges we face as a business, uh, although the rebate is good and it provides growth for the industry, when it comes and goes, it provides uncertainty for a business like ours, so we can't plan as long into the future uh, like we would like to. So the, the biggest uh, example of that that I can think of is there's one gap in the program of 14 months. So uh, 14 months where people understand that there's a rebate program coming back, but it's not there right now. We had no sales for 14 months straight. Makes it a little difficult to run a business that way. 
Um, some of the other challenges with education, um, public education, we do events like this all the time, trade shows, people call us all the time, lots of public education. And then uh, the other part that we do is, um, or that we find is a challenge, is the workforce. So we don't often get people coming to us that have been trained in renewable energy, know it real well, and are gonna be uh, a real um, strong asset to us right out of the gate. Um, I think a lot of people here in engineering, uh, how many people have taken a course specifically related to renewable energy? There's a few. In Germany? Yeah. yeah. Anybody from Canada that have done courses here? Sorry? In the UK? Yeah. There's one other one I think too. Yeah. It was a private course. It was a private course? Yeah. So that was my experience too. When I was in university, there was no courses that I could take related specifically to renewables. I took some courses uh, that had parts that were renewable energy, and then I had to focus my own courses around working with some professors that were into hydrogen and wind energy at that time. And uh, my final year project was related to wind energy, but that was really self-directed. So I had to kind of carve out my own path and make sure I was getting into the industry that I wanted to. And uh, as a result, when I graduated, I hooked up with some guys that were starting a company and they wanted me to develop uh, the commercial side of the business from there. So um, I think in the future, we're gonna see a lot more growth and a lot more opportunity for classes, but right now it's limited and that's what we find in our workforce. There's very few people that come to us and you know have that training or um, uh, any kind of background in renewables at all. So some of the opportunities um, moving forward, uh, Jenna was alluding to the growth in solar and what's happening in solar compared to other energy industries. This graph you can see uh, is almost an exponential curve. Um, it's uh, very similar to what we've seen in Saskatchewan when I started in the industry in 2007. Every year, we wouldn't quite double in size with the industry in general, but there was a big growth, uh, growth curve to it. So uh, this year, I think we're gonna see the same thing moving forward. Um, the people at My Energy uh, have designed and installed roughly half of all the projects in the province. So between the four to five megawatts or 4,000 to 5,000 kilowatts, we've done about half that. And um, the 60 megawatts that's planned and they've been talking about in the next few years on utility scale, that's just gonna drive the growth of it even faster. So the utility scale stuff coming on, one 10 megawatt project is gonna double the size and the capacity of solar in the province. So there's gonna be a lot more focus on that. We're gonna see a lot more growth uh, in the utility scale and it's gonna drive the, the residential and commercial side as well. One of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of growth these days, um, this is just uh, kind of a return on investment type model. Uh, we show a lot of our customers things like this. At today's rates, um, what the bottom graph is showing here, if you were to add solar to a new home, as an example, at uh, current um, interest rates over 25 years, uh, similar to any mortgage you can get, you're gonna have a cost, a uh, finance monthly payment that's about the same as your power bill would have been previously. So you're kind of locking in your rate at today's rate for the next 25 years, where um, every year the solar, or the price of uh, power, if you don't have solar, is going up. So you're gonna save that much more money every year. Sorry, you had a question there? Yeah, um, that 60 megawatt plan, yeah. I, I in here just said it on, how many years does that be? Uh, there's, they haven't released all the details of that, so you guys might have heard that uh, by 2030 the plan is to get to 50% renewables in Saskatchewan. And as part of that plan they've announced that there's going to be 60 megawatts of solar over the next few years, but I don't think that they've said it's all going to be next year that they start procuring that. I know there's going to be some procurement fairly soon, but I don't know if it's all 60 megawatts to be built in the next three to five years or, or what it is. They haven't really released all the details of that yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in general, I mean, the finance monthly payments can be the same as your power bills today if you're adding something like a mortgage. So you can save money from day one, lock in those costs. Long warranty periods with solar match those uh, uh, mortgage time ones. Uh, this chart's just kind of showing that uh, Saskatchewan has a lot of roof space and a lot of sun. So we could provide up to 88% of all of our residential power requirements 
with rooftop solar. So there's a lot of opportunity for growth right now. We're just starting to uh, scratch the surface of what's possible. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity in the rooftop markets in the future um, because we have so much sun here in Saskatchewan. Another uh, growth industry that we're seeing is people wanting to build the smart homes of the future. So some customers uh, come to us and say we want geothermal and solar so we can have uh, a home that has all of its energy and heating produced on site. We don't want to have anything from the grid. They're adding that to new beautiful homes that are being um, built and focusing on those energy systems as a key part of that. So some of the predictions for um, the next year and the future. Um, in the second half of this year, as we get closer to the place where uh, the 20% rebate is going to be disappearing, we're going to see growth. In general, we'd see a lot of growth, but it seems like when these programs are starting to come to an end, a lot of people jump in and want to get into uh, a rebate program before it's gone, get that extra 20% that's not covered otherwise. Um, and with that, we're going to see more new entrants. There's going to be new companies that are in the industry and looking for people to, to help them. So if there's more people that uh, are um, knowledgeable in renewable energy, I think there's, there's going to be opportunity there with uh, growth in other companies as well as new companies that, that come along. Um, the spotlight in solar is going to grow. Uh, as these big utility scale projects come online and start being developed, people are going to take notice. They're going to say, uh, you know, it's working great here. It'll work good for other places too. That'll drive all the renewable energy industry. But uh, we're really seeing other companies that are coming to us now asking how they can get into uh, renewable energy. We've had uh, steel fabricators come to us recently and say, hey, you know, can we provide racking for you? How can we get into solar? Do you guys need any help in different ways? Other companies that want to provide labor, um, all kinds of different things that we're starting to make partnerships and, and here people want to get into, uh, into solar because they know what's coming. Uh, another prediction, I think after the election um, this spring, we're going to see uh, an increase in power pricing. Um, traditionally, over the last 30 years, the increase in power has been about 6% per year. Um, I think there's some reasons why we might see increases that are even larger than that in the future. Um, clean coal, things like that, they drive, uh, drive costs um, higher. Aging infrastructure, new power needs in the provinces we grow. All those things are going to cause uh, power increases uh, that are necessary. Um, in the next part, I think there's going to be some excess capacity. Um, in the U.S., there's something called uh, investment tax credit. So it's a 30% investment tax credit. It was due to end at the end of 2016. So all the manufacturers were ramping up to meet that market. And um, it's recently been extended uh, indefinitely. So all that excess uh, manufacturing that was due to all go in in 2016 in a rush to get in before the 30% investment tax credit disappeared. I think there's going to be some extra um, manufacturing capacity. It'll bring prices down a little bit in the cost of the panels, but unfortunately for us that's being offset by a strong US dollar or a weak Canadian dollar, however you want to look at it. So our prices are hopefully not going to go up too much, but um, we've had a lot of uh, pressure um, from the US dollar. Clean coal. Um, this is the boundary dam. Um, I think our government's going to start looking to diversify away from traditional energy into things uh, like renewables. We've heard them say 50% renewables by 2030. That's going to take a lot of work. It's only 14 years to get there. That's a lot of capacity to get there. So although they're pushing things like clean coal, um, I think that that'll start to diversify. And, Really, when you look at clean coal, it's kind of like the guy with the horse and buggy trying to sell you on an improved manure system uh, for catching the, the crap before it gets out while there's cars driving by on the street. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things that I think is uh, an aging infrastructure. In most places in the world, they're shutting down coal and not uh, trying to um, collect the garbage that's going into the air. Um, and battery storage. I think that uh, you, both utility and um, backup for, for homes is going to be important in the future. Uh, many people have heard of uh, Tesla and the, the Powerwall system for homes that's going to be a backup. 
as the cost of lithium ion batteries comes down in price, I think there's gonna be a bigger market for uh, battery and backup systems. A lot of our technology integrates with Tesla Powerwall and other lithium ion systems already. So as that's available in the future, costs come down, they'll be able to add that on to uh, a lot of the grid tied solar systems that are available today. So I just wanted to chat a bit about something that I'm working on starting with a group of young people here in Saskatoon. Um, name to be determined, because we had a good chat on Tuesday night about maybe changing the name and, and what we are. But um, so the Emerging Leaders for Solar Energy Program is a national um, organization that was started by CANSIA, which is the Canadian Solar Industries Association. So the Emerging Leaders Program is sort of a, the youth program within CANSIA. They have chapters all across Canada. It's mostly, mostly BC and Ontario, starting to be a little bit in Alberta, but we haven't had a chapter here in Saskatchewan yet. So it's something that we see, and I definitely see, as filling a gap for young people here in Saskatchewan because there currently isn't really a lot of connection as most of you know because you haven't taken classes in renewable energy there currently isn't a lot of connection for young people to be a part of this industry or to even know people in the industry or understand how it works how they can make a career out of it what choices or things they could get involved in to be more active in that community of people so the emerging leaders program is gonna be focused on filling those gaps. We're gonna do some public education stuff. Um, hopefully if we get some folks involved, we already do. Emily was at the meeting and Dylan was at the meeting, some folks in the room here. Um, hopefully if we have some folks involved from University of Saskatchewan and SIAST, if you're a student at these institutions, maybe putting some pressure on administration to say, hey, or if you know a professor who's been thinking about teaching a class in it, saying, hey, look at the room full of people here tonight who are interested in this industry, and if there was opportunity for them to be a little more educated in it, you'd be excited about it, those kinds of things. It's basically just gonna provide a link for young people into the industry. Hopefully, as the industry grows and people involved in the industry grows, we'll be able to offer something like a, I would love to see like a mentorship program, so you would have the opportunity to even just meet for coffee with, with someone in the industry who is doing work that maybe you're interested in doing. Um, it sounds like most folks in the room come from an engineering background, but I want to make it very clear that this group and, and most groups, I think, involved in renewable energy are focused on things outside of engineering and tech as well. So that's a huge component of it, really important component. But so is the business and economic side of things, as we saw a lot of it talks about economics. So is the policy, public policy side of things. So people who want to work in renewable energy or renewables from a public policy perspective, that's awesome. We need those people too. So this group is going to be a part of kind of bridging those gaps and bringing young people closer to the industry that already exists in the province and then hopefully being a part of expanding it in the province as well. So if you are interested in that, um, chat with me afterwards. Write down this email at the bottom there. You can email that. I'll be answering it right now. Uh, we've just had our first meeting. It's that new. So if you are eager to get involved in something like this, please do. That'd be awesome. The more the barrier, the more ideas in the room, I think the more um, fruitful the conversation can be and the more that we'll all get out of it. But the idea of it is to really connect people like who are here today, like myself, um, with people who are already working in the industry. So that's what it is, and I would love to have more folks involved, whether you're able to take a leadership role while you're a student or not, or just be engaged with what's going on and help when you can. That'd be awesome. Um, I'm sure by the sounds of it, we will be partnering with the Innovative Energy team at USASC a lot, because a lot of what they're doing here on campus for students is what emerging leaders would kind of be doing throughout the province as a whole, and I think that's a really awesome connection to have. Um, I don't. I personally didn't go to University of Saskatchewan, so I don't know who the professors are who do this. So that kind of a link and knowing students and stuff is really important. So having more students involved in that group would be really great. So yeah, please get in touch if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and then yeah, we have lots of time for questions slash discussion. Um, but I just wanted to highlight. Uh, we are on social media and I do manage it and I love getting new followers so um, if you're a Twitter user or Facebook user or Instagram user I try to keep them relatively updated 
as much as I can. Um, hopefully soon with more like video stuff, meet the team stuff, exciting stuff, I think. Um, so yeah, please give us a follow and then we'll just move into questions, discussion, thoughts. Yeah. Uh, do you import the PV plugins from outside Canada or? Uh, both, yeah. Sometimes projects will use uh, panels from, from elsewhere and uh, sometimes they're manufactured in Canada. Um, we've got several different suppliers that we use. Uh, one of the main ones is Canadian Solar, so they've got head office in Canada um, and uh, a lot of manufacturing capacity in Canada. And what is the impact of the recent drop in the oil price on the business? On the Sorry, say that again. What is the impact of this recent drop in the oil prices on the solar business in Canada? You know, really, there hasn't been much impact. There's, it's, you know, the oil industry isn't really a direct competitor in the power market, and what we deal with is in the power market more than anything else uh, for solar specifically. So we don't really see a big impact there. Um, you know, driving your car is cheaper, but you still got to buy power from the utility, which comes from other places. There was a few. If you do follow us on Facebook or Twitter at some point. Um, they're US-based articles. There isn't a lot that is focused on the Canadian solar industry versus like what's happening in the Canadian oil industry. Um, but there was two articles fairly recent, like within the past month that I posted um, that were focused more heavily on the US industry. And there's articles written that say the drop in oil prices is just doing wonders for solar. And then there's other articles that write and say actually an increase in oil prices would boost the industry just that much more. Um, either way, a fall or a drop in the oil prices, no matter which article you look at, isn't having a huge impact. <coughs> Definitely not a negative impact on the solar industry, so, yeah. Sure. Oh, the that um, in, the, in, the, in the United States that uh, they have a, they're designing industrial complexes? Where they use uh, reflectors to focus on to uh, the power. Is there a push for that in the province right now? Because that's more so on the special application yeah. for the solar power. Is, is there almost is all of the utility uh, growth that we see is very similar to what we do? So um, just a larger scale of the same thing. Uh, there are places that are. Um, working on those types of things. And every once in a while, you'll see a project that is uh, the tower and reflector type of um, system that'll you know, heat, yeah. heat and create I, I turbines. I think this have a high potential here in Canada, the solar, because we have solar cell and the photovoltaic. Yeah. I think this solar cell, which use like the tower, would not have a high potential in Canada, because like the other here is very, very poor. Yeah. So you yeah. have like a high challenge, how to store this amount of heat which you are producing. So I think that the photovoltaic has a high potential here because even like this system can work without any sun. If you have also like light only, it will be working very well. Yeah. So I think yeah. this is, has a high potential here. That's right. And you, all the utility scale projects, there's very few that happen. I don't think there's any uh, projects like that in Canada. There's, there's some that I know of in the US, but almost all the utility scale projects you see are all related to uh, the standard PV panel, creating, creating electricity, not driving like a, a turbine with steam or something. I'm trying to do my best to keep track. There was a question here and a question in the back as well. Yeah. So, you want to go with it? Yeah, sure. Um, in a lot of your photos, I noticed that a lot of your arrays, or most of them, are all stationary. And they don't have, is, is it tracking, would that, having, yeah. having a tracking system, would that be really beneficial or is it not cost effective? <laughs> Or why is that not introduced? Yeah, typically we've always focused on systems that are um, stationary and don't track. Um, there are other places, there's uh, policies and things in place that really create extra revenue from um, a tracking system. So Ontario, as an example, they've got a limit on uh, a high price they'll pay for 10 kilowatt systems and below. So people put in 10 kilowatt systems to track so they get money at that higher rate where here, um, a lot of times, um, our experience has shown a tracking system in the winter time, when it gets really cold, the actuators and pieces and parts that are moving, they're stationary anyways, because they stop working properly when it's really cold here. Um, and then also, we found that um, if you want to get more power, 
add more panels, add more racking. Now you have a system with no moving parts, no maintenance, and uh, you know it's about the same cost as adding a tracking system. So for a more reliable system with the same amount of power, if you just make it bigger, typically that's the best way to go, and that's the analysis that we've, we've gone through. Awesome. Yeah. Question in the back corner. Uh, it's more, <coughs> sorry, it's more a suggestion. Uh, you were mentioning um, interest in having a course here at the university in solar uh, energy or alternative energy. Um, there is an instructor, she's a, a session instructor, Angie Orla. She's done teaching in um, electrical and EP and some general engineering courses. She's one of the top solar experts in the, co in the country, if not just uh, Saskatchewan. And if electrical could be convinced to uh, fund her to develop a course, she'd be one of the best people to give it. She's actually giving a talk at the IEEE Illumination Conference on Saturday. So if any of you are interested, you should catch her talk. But uh, she'd be a fantastic person to teach that course. She lives in a net zero house. Um, would never do it again, actually. Um, she, she, she learned a lot, and she would not live in a net zero house again. But um, she knows tons of stuff about solar and wind and geothermal. And she's an electrical engineer. Um, and she probably do a great job teaching that course if you could give it to the There you go. Action, action item. Question here. I was just going to ask what uh, some of you shed light on some of the challenges that winter brings with the industry in Saskatchewan. Uh, do you want to have a little? I can try my best. <laughs> um, so, while there's some obvious things, we, we have less light in the winter time so we have less hours of sunlight in the, in the winter time obviously so that is an issue the sun is lower in the sky so if you know if you don't have a tracking system depending on that angle of your panels that brings an issue when we install things on the ground we the angle is optimal to catch year round so we try to have it at an angle that makes sense for winter as well as summer that being said it's not straight up and down so it's not going to catch everything that there is to catch um, but one thing that's unknown or not very well known uh, by most folks is panels actually operate better under cooler temperatures. So not necessarily in the dead of winter in January in Saskatchewan is that the best, but um, we have high sunlight all winter long. We see that when we have a warm winter like this, it's often more cloudy when we have our typical winter when it's a lot colder, it's a lot sunnier. So our, our spring and our fall months are also awesome months because of the cool operating temperatures for panels themselves so they'll operate more efficiently when they're a little bit cooler so that's a positive thing snow is an issue obviously most of the the panels that you see like that that one that we installed it's at an angle where the likelihood of snow actually falling on that and sticking is very low um if it is you just take a shot for it off for most people the really where you can run into issues is if you flush mount something on a roof with a 412 pitch or less, something where it's a lot more flat, you're going to lose your winter production. Not all of it, obviously, because once the panels, so if there's a little corner of a panel that's um, cleared off, that panel will actually produce a little bit of heat in the winter as well, so they, they do melt off. So there is some stuff that exists that makes it a little better, but still, if you're, if you're flat mounting a roof in Saskatchewan in the winter, you're going to run into maintenance, which isn't the maintenance of necessarily a tracker, but it's still human time to get up there and, and burn it off. I don't know if you want to add Yeah, the only thing that I'd add to that, there's um, a recent study that was done at uh, uh, Nate in Edmonton, and it kind of tracked clearing snow off panels versus leaving it and just letting the wind or um, sun melt it off. And what they found is typically about four or five percent uh, energy loss throughout the winter you just leave it alone don't clear snow that kind of thing so it makes me feel a lot better because I typically haven't cleared snow from my solar panels so uh, the losses really aren't that that significant to, uh, to worry about. Question up here and then up back. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is about the uh, what kind of partnerships do you have in the cities so they are making green communities and the reason I ask is like an evergreen, which is supposed to be a green community, the angle of the slope is um, you can't build more than a 30 degree angle. 
So it's not an optimal photovoltaic installation angle, but they call it green. Yeah. So what kind of collaboration do you have with the different cities so that they can educate and have them, you know, put in policies and building codes in place that enable uh, maximum output from photovoltaics? Yeah. Um, I live in Evergreen, and I, I know exactly what you mean. I, uh, I, I remember the initial package um, that came out in Evergreen promoting every lot to have really good southern exposure, which is true. Um, but most builders don't think about building the roof to face south properly, or like you said, the building codes can't allow you to, to put an angle of 40 degrees roughly, which is optimal in our climate. Um, so, working with those groups, I think, is, is very important in, in helping that, but um, I think it's almost an onus on the building uh, companies as well. We work with several, several builders in, uh, um, in the city, throughout the province, that will have designs that are better for solar gain, and uh, it's really up to the people designing those homes. So. Although it would be very nice if uh, the whole subdivision was planned for everybody to have that exposure and have um, a certain amount of southern facing roof space required at a certain angle, um, that's not there right now, and it's really kind of something that's missed. But you're right; there should be more consultation right now. We don't have enough of that um, through our business specifically with the building code people. All I would add to that is just um, if you do have a relationship with the city, even if you don't have a relationship with the city, if you should have a relationship with your city councillor, especially the one if you live in Evergreen, um, he's really great, but I have been in a few city of South, like meetings with administration, not councillors, but many meetings with administration recently, um, and the folks within the city working on this stuff are, are really doing great, So the and they are pushing for a lot of stuff, so they really need folks in this room to be pushing our city councillors to uh, favor those things because administration is definitely not the, uh, the issue I think in most cases like there's some people within um, city of Saskatoon and Saskatoon Light Power who are doing some incredible work and pushing really hard so I think we all just need to give our city councillors a little more encouragement to support those kinds of things too. So. Um, there, oh, did you have one more? Sorry. Um, the, second, the second question is around the building envelope. Because this is about electricity generation. But what about reducing electricity consumption, which is directly tied to how much our value we put in the and use? Are you uh, focusing on educating the communities and the contractors and the builders around how to design a house or a building that reduces energy consumption? There's, there's some really good builders in, in the city that uh, are quite innovative and do really good design. Um, Verico Homes is one of them. Um, you know, Mason Fine Homes, we work with them as well. They've got some, some nice designs. Uh, and a lot of them do focus on those things, but I think that's really up to the builder. Um, the, the building code itself is fairly lacking uh, if you're gonna try to get to a net zero type of home. You have to go so far beyond what the standard building code is, or even the R2000 um, levels, to get to a net zero type of home. The onus is really on um, the consumer to try to ask for that through their uh, building contractors and have that availability and that knowledge through the, the builders. But um, yeah, again, I, I don't know that the building code is gonna shift that far anytime soon to, to get to that point. There is definitely recommendations right now, so just removing my mind energy hat. I also sit on the board for the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, and they are pushing um, on, like with city council right now, a lot um, to change the building code, at least in Saskatoon, to an R80. So R80 on the roof. That's a good question. I'm not sure. It's all published if you if you go to Saskatchewan Environmental Society's website, they have their recommendations published. Um, and if you do live in uh, Evergreen, your city councillor, Zach Jeffries, also is pushing really heavily for changes in the building codes. And the reason for that is because 
75% of all new construction in the province happens in Saskatoon. Um, so what happens is the cities are like, well, we're going to wait till the provincial folks go ahead and change the building code. But a lot of people here are like, well, if Saskatoon changes the building code, the building code is going to change. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of pressure here to say, hey, Saskatoon, we can be a leader in this. And if we're a leader in this, Regina would likely follow. And then if Regina and Saskatoon are doing it, the province is going to do it. So um, from my knowledge, there's lack of um, uh, capacity to enforce or capacity to uh, inspect was one of the reasons that it's taking a lot longer than most of us would like to see. So, yeah. uh, there's a few questions at the back. Yes. Hi, uh, uh, she answered part of my question, but I was going to I have three questions actually. One is um, what are the opportunities available for getting an internship? And the second one is um, when you talk about smart homes, are they passive houses or passive houses that have net zero, you know, causing any electricity or fossil fuels? And um, what are the, uh, the steps you take to partner with are you guys doing solar thermal as well or just solar panels? Okay, your first question, I will start with your first question. Your first question was about like you particular getting like involved in companies in the industry. Okay, um, I, I can, I'm happy to speak to that from like a personal perspective. So, um, first of all, <laughs> it's not easy at any for anybody in any position. Um, job searching at all like I think it's something that um, is a challenge and, and the way to start doing that I think is to use opportunities that aren't necessarily paid opportunities to get experience doing different things so whether that's like taking on a research project that's particular specific to if you're interested in solar sure solar if you're interested in passive building do something related to passive building something that shows that your interest isn't just you know, you being interested, um, but you've actually taken steps to to focus your education on those things. Um, the other suggestion I would have, if you aren't already, get involved in different things in the city that are doing those types of like that type of work. So, and I'm happy to chat about this as well afterwards. But um, so, getting involved in different boards that do things related to renewable energy. Um, meeting for coffee with people from the industry and this is something that i'm hoping the emerging leaders program can kind of help with and and uh, innovative energy team is kind of working on that side same stuff too here at the university so it's really about those connections i don't think um like i can say from experience it's definitely not the case that every solar company in all of saskatchewan is going to have a job posting this year or is going to have 10 job postings this year i don't think that's the reality of it um a lot of it is around how you carve out your own path, so whether that's through research or getting involved in things that are already happening in your community, that's kind of how it happens. It's not necessarily one of those things that's moving so much right now that everybody in this room is going to is gonna fall into a position like that right away. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. But. Yeah, no, I, I think you said it really well. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Sorry, and then your second question was about... Passive host and that's right. Yeah. Um, so that's all. Like, do you know of you know, like, a package where the you know, whole house is solar thermal, solar energy thermal? Yeah, we're we're partnered with uh, some some good companies that that do offer uh, the full design package. But what we focus on and uh, our expertise is in solar power for electricity, geothermal heating and cooling. So those two um, working together. Uh, you can get to the net zero point, um, but a lot of that has to do with how the, the home is built and we don't have packages that we offer that are um, kind of the whole building design or anything like that. We focus on the energy and uh, the heating and cooling. But there's definitely home builders in Saskatoon who offer yeah. that kind of expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, EcoSmart uh, is, is one. Um, uh, integrated Designs, Murray Guy um, does as a commercial and uh, residential um, company for both of those. 
we work with uh, Mason Homes. They're pretty progressive on um, uh, design that's uh, uh, green and clean. Um, Rico Homes is another one, as I mentioned before. There's one more question. So you guys have your own packages developed that basically the contractor came to you and said, hey, I've got a customer that wants a solar system. Uh, I've just come to you and you have all the material. Absolutely, yeah. We do uh, the design. Um, so typically it's a custom design. Usually it's not, hey, here's the package you want to slap on. Um, basically we'll, we'll do a design for whatever the usage is. If it's a new home, we'll look at the size of family, how the home's building being constructed, and design a custom package for that that'll fit on the roof nicely, good aesthetics, things like that. And then we take that project all the way through uh, the construction phase. Um, Commissioning, electrical, the whole bit. So we do all the paperwork through SAS Power, everything related to that. How does that process change when you try to retrofit um, out? It's a very similar process. It's a little easier sometimes because they'll have uh, a straight power bills and they can say, here's what we've used over the last few years, and we can design exactly to that, uh, that need or a little bit less so we're not overproducing. Um, but um, you know, there's some things, you know, during the building process to do the electrical while the walls are open to make it a little easier sometimes, but um, we do just as many retrofits, if not more, as, as new homes. Do you run into structural issues by putting this stuff on? Typically not. Um, we, we have to look at it in some cases, but um, in general, it's about two pounds per square feet or per square foot for, for the panels and the racking which compared to typical snow loads is fairly insignificant. And uh, usually it's not an issue, but it depends on uh, the building. Steve, did you have a question? Yeah, and uh, apparently there's a meeting here at seven, so uh, oh. this is the last one. Okay. But uh, we can probably read out there. I don't know if anyone has any questions for you guys. Cool. Um, I guess, so you guys have talked about all these opportunities that uh, I guess bringing the solar is getting to the case in the future. You also talk about uh, a lack of technically trained people right now who are kind of available to seize us. Are there any resources available for people, like, I guess, in our position to kind of get themselves ready to take on these opportunities when they, you know, when they start coming up? Yeah, I guess I'll just have a bit of a plug for my energy right now. A lot of the good people that we have started in our, uh, our programs that were summer students. So worked in, in through the summer student program and turned into full-time employees eventually, that kind of thing. Some of the best people that we have were, were like that. Um, so it's always an opportunity to be a summer student at My Energy. A lot of the other companies that, um, that work in the industry as well probably have similar programs also. Um, but yeah, I don't know what else. Yeah, there's a few others, and, and if people want to get in touch with me afterwards, I can send links to. I haven't actually taken any of these courses, but there is, Dave and I are actually talking about them today. There is courses that are offered through different, um, Solar Energy International is one of them. Um, there's a few other more Canadian focused ones that you can take. They're online courses, so that's, I know that's not for everybody, but those are some ways that if you are thinking from a very like core space perspective, um, there is stuff like that that exists for sure. Uh, I think sometimes just like like jumping into it as a summer student, if you have the opportunity, is a really is a really good way to meet people in the industry and things like that too. Um, but there's definitely courses out there that exist, and I'm happy to send links for the information that I have. Yeah, I guess the other one is the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. It's the best course that I've seen for the solar industry um, from. There's, there's courses on sales there, but the main one is the PV installers course, and it's really, really um, technically oriented and uh, very comprehensive. So if you can pass that course, you'll do very well in the industry for sure. The one issue with it is, is it's um, based on the National Electric Code instead of the Canadian Electric Code. You know, usually the codes are very similar, but um, you know, to, to know the National Electric Code and where to look and reference things. It's very different than the Canadian, so it's somewhat confusing there, but you'll learn everything you need to if you had, uh, you know, the PV installers level at NABSEP. It's pretty uh, comprehensive. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate that. Yeah.